Now, we're proposing with this series that the person whom you're eager to someday meet and spend the rest of your life with might be someone already present in your life. That's it. Simply suggesting that the person whom you're going to spend the rest of your life with might be a friend who's already present in your life. Without getting creepy on any one of your friends, like tomorrow, I'm saying, right? I'm not, don't, don't, don't do that, right? I'm not saying do that, right? But I'm simply suggesting that you would consider for a moment what a relationship would look like with someone already in your life, someone of the opposite sex already in your life, who, 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 uh, who already likes you, knows all your quirks, and still likes you, likes to hang out with you, how, how cool would that be? And here's why I suggest that. I, I think, I know I did before I got married. We often think in, of marriage in terms of romance, right? Attraction, heat. We're going to love each other all the days of our lives. We're going to get married and day and night. We're just going to stare at each other. We're going to have sex every night. It's going to be so great. We're going to, all right? We often think in relationships in terms of, did I just weird you out? Hey, Andrew, Andrew was like, dude, really? All right, so we often think in terms of relationships, in ro- uh, think in romance terms. But um, here's the reality. Great marriages are built on good friendships. In fact, I, I, marriage is primarily about friendship. Romance comes as a result of friendship. You with me so far? A natural chemistry between two people who like each other in spite of their shortcomings, and might I add on to that, a commitment to Jesus Christ is the best foundation you can lay for a marriage. Now, this does not negate the possibility of someday meeting someone out there. I'm simply saying... Without getting creepy, consider that the person whom you might want to spend the rest of your life with is already a friend in your life. In the book, uh, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, the authors, uh, two respected sociologies, make this interesting observation. They say this. They say that the determ- listen to this, the determining factor in whether wives feel satisfied with sex, romance, and passion in their marriage is by 70% the quality of their friendship with their spouse. In fact, they did the same survey for men, and it said the percentage is 70%. The defining factor in how satisfied they feel with marriage is the level of friendship they have with their spouse. And they end with this. They say, as it turns out, men and women are from the same planet after all. Women are not from Mars, or men are not from Mars. Women are not from Venus. We're from the same planet. So the point is simple with the series. Um, Marry your friend. If you're already married or seriously dating, your, your relationship is heading towards the altar, uh, might I suggest that you work on building a strong friendship? All right? So, so that when you're dating, it's not about, oh, I can't wait to see your eyes and can't wait to touch your, you know, stuff. And, and right, <laughs> wow, I am like, I'm going to go wrong. Right. Can I just have your permission to mess up? All right? Um, right? It, it's about friendship. It's about friendship. Right. So that's what we're going to be doing with the series. In fact, every message during this series hopefully will be encouraging that to say, hey, listen, yes, there might be an opportunity to someday meet the one. But would you consider those whom God's already placed in your life as close friends? Now, to start us off um, with tonight, I think it's important that I help you identify what kinds of friends we're talking about when I say marry your friend. Right. Because not everyone who you're friendly with is necessarily um, your future spouse, right? Um, There are qualities that both genders need to cultivate in their lives before you go asking someone out or before you let someone pursue you intentionally. And with this series, I'm not going to talk a lot about what to look for and how to go find a person. I'm going to talk about what you should be, right? Because when you go into a relationship, men, you should not only be expecting, but you should be a gift. And that's going to take work. Anyway, so that's where we're going. Um, And and tonight, really, I'm going to be speaking to the guys. Um, I'm going to be speaking to the guys tonight. And and ladies, I want you guys to listen in uh, because it'll give you a lot of insight into the kind of guy you should let pursue you. Okay? So so I'm really speaking to tonight's message for the guys. Next week is going to be for the girls. But ladies, please listen in because this is good stuff that'll help you discern 
okay, maybe I should really allow this guy emotional space in my life. By the way, that's a term I'll use for when a guy's chasing you to date you. You're giving him emotional space in your life, okay? That's my phrase. Um, now, guys, rather than give you counsel on the kind of female friend you should be looking to marry, fellas, I want to talk to you tonight about the kind of man you should be. In fact, the kind of male friend that you should be, or at least strive to be, before you go chasing after a girl asking for her hand in marriage. And that's a very important thing for me to do because when a girl or when a woman stands in front of you on your wedding day and she looks you in the eye and there are tears glistening in her eyes and the priest or the pastor asks her, do you take this man, blah, 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 and you say, and the girl says to you, I do, um, this girl is essentially trusting you that for the rest of her life you're not going to hit her you're not going to hurt her. You're not going to cheat on her. She's trusting that you're going to work hard. You're going to pay the bills. You're going to love her, care for your children, love and serve Jesus Christ. You're going to stay with her even if she gets sick. You're going to stay with her until the day Jesus Christ calls either one of you guys home to be with the Lord. It's a great responsibility. I bet you didn't think that when you were chasing that girl, did you? Right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great responsibility, but it's an honorable responsibility. Whoever finds a good wife finds a good thing. It's an honorable thing. And it's my deepest desire as we do this series that we would produce godly men, not boyish men, godly men who are God-loving, responsible, hardworking, and, and who, who love and respect and take care of the women in their lives. Fellas, it's not an easy task. But that's part of your calling in life. Okay, so let's jump right into tonight's message. Guys, tonight's message... It's titled, uh, actually it's titled Man Up, but my wife said that sounded mean, so it's called, I like that guy. Doesn't matter anyway, because we're done. Anyway, so, um, last semester, last fall, I was invited to William Patterson to speak at their young adult group, uh, their college campus group, and actually I was invited to speak at their student center at an open forum, uh, and it was called um, God, Sex, and Pizza. Don't ask. Um, but I'm there, and basically what it was, I'm at the student center, and uh, you know, Christian Fellowship and all their friends Basically, they, they went to town, just like ask me whatever they want about God, pizza, <laughs> no, God and sex, not God and pizza. They could ask me whatever they wanted to ask. And, you know, I got a bunch of questions and it was actually a fun thing just to kind of give them some biblical insight. I mean, I was talking to secular students, but one of the questions that one of the girls asked really stuck with me. And the reason why it stuck with me is because at the time I didn't have a real comprehensive answer. Um, but obviously I've sat on it for a while and I've had some time to think about it and I think I have something better to offer. And so the girl at that session asked me, she said, I wanna know why it is that it is necessary for two people who genuinely love each other and care for one another. I wanna know why it's, why it's so necessary, why the church or pastors think it's necessary for two people who genuinely love and care for one another to need a paper contract to indicate that they're married. Why can't we just live together? Why do I need a paper contract to say I'm married? And at the time, I remember telling her something about commitments and, and you know, it just kind of shut her up. But um, after that, I, I, I've had some time to think about it now. And I, like I said, I have something better to offer. And, and by the way, as I go into this for guys, the answer I'm going to give to you or the response is really the biblical starting point from which I'm going to give you counsel on the type of man that you should be striving to become. All right. So, fellas, please listen closely to this. And in fact, what I'm going to give you this evening uh, as a side benefit, not only will it give you counsel on how to strive to become a better man, but it's actually good counsel in making you more attractive to the female friends in your life. This has physical beauty or your outfit. This is character issues. I'm going to walk you through some steps that, like I said, my desire is that it will produce godly character in you, which in turn, as a side benefit, will make you deeply attractive, more attractive to the female friends already in your life. So back to her question, she asked me, why do we need a paper contract? I think her understanding or her misunderstanding comes from the fact that she saw marriage as a contract, as opposed to what the Bible describes marriage, a covenant. Now, it, the most basic definition of those words basically mean the same thing, really, <laughs> marriage is a contract, but, but when it comes to the biblical understanding of marriage, well, let me back up this way. In a marriage contract, here's what happens in a marriage contract. Two people are obligated or two people sign into a deal and they're both obligated to hold up their end of the bargain so that if one person doesn't live up to the agreed upon terms, the deal can be nullified. That's a contract. And by the way, that's what we see in a lot of marriages that last for like a year. 
People get married, sparks, excitement, oh, we broke up. That's because they entered into a contract as opposed to a covenant marriage. You see, in a biblical covenant marriage, the relationship, and here's the difference, the relationship is based, first and foremost, get this, on the commitment to God and then the commitment to one another. Please hear me on this. On the day when you get married, when you stand before your family and friends and you say, I do, you're saying, I do. You know, we often talk, do you take this woman in the presence of, okay, primarily you're doing this in the presence of God because God established the marriage. So your commitment is first and foremost to God. Now here's why that understanding is important, especially for you guys. In a covenant marriage, covenant biblical marriage, God has entrusted the responsibility of leading to the guy within that relationship. Let me say that again. In a Christian home, a biblical godly marriage, guys, God has entrusted the responsibility of leading in that relationship to you. That's a high calling. And part of God's expectation for you, fellows, is that you would lead your wife, love her, provide for her, and get this, you got to give yourself sacrificially to her. Like when I said lead, it's possible some of you guys might have thought, ooh, I finally get to be the boss. No, it means you get to give yourself away. You, you, you lead by example. Give yourself completely to her. And you know what our model is for that? Jesus Christ, right? Because Jesus Christ loves, leads, gave himself for the church. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 5, 22, it says that. It says that husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. It's a high calling. It's an honorable calling, fellas. It's a good thing to desire your wife, but it's a high calling. It's an honorable calling. Ladies, my hope is that you're listening in on this. So what I want to do with the rest of our time tonight, really for you fellas, is to give you, is to give you um, or help lay out for you what needs to be present in your life, fellas, before you go asking for a girl's hand in marriage. At the same time, I want to give you counsel on what biblical leadership looks like. And by the way, if you're single, you can begin putting this into play even with your female friends. I mean, some of it will apply, some of it won't. All right, so if you're single, you're thinking, I'm not married yet, this is good for you. You need to learn this now. Because here's why. You don't learn to be a husband in marriage. Actually, you do, but a lot of the lessons be start before you get married. A lot of the qualities that will be a huge blessing to your wife start way before you get married. I, I keep saying this. I am so glad that I met my wife when I did. I keep thinking if I had met her a year before, that would have been a mess. I mean, it's not perfect now, right? I still got a lot of issues. Or she, yeah, I still got a lot of issues, right? <laughs> still working through them. Um, but man, I was at a different point in emotional states a year before, just very insecure. And, and a matter of fact, during that year before I got married, I traveled to Nigeria where, you know, I went through a bunch of stuff that there are things called father wounds. I had to deal with a lot of emotional junk that had happened in my life, really surrendered that to God. And, and as I was letting that go was really when I met my wife and I thought, man, God's timing is good. So guys, I want to set you up. For this, ladies, once again, I would appreciate if you would listen in carefully, attentively, because as I'm speaking to the guys, I'm really speaking to you, and I'm telling you to say, this is the kind of guy you should let, or you should give emotional space in your heart, in your life. Okay, let's jump right in. Fellas, this is you. Um, the number one indicator, guys, <laughs> this is, <laughs> so, you know, I'm not even going to apologize. Let me just do it. All right. Um, guys, the number one indicator that you have transitioned from boyhood to manhood, right? Because uh, we don't want boys getting married. We want men getting married, right? The number one indicator that you've transitioned from boyhood into manhood and are at a good place to start asking a girl out, and even just to date her, right? Uh, let me even back up and say this. I know I'm kind of going on bunny trails here. Um, if you're going to date, you should date on purpose. And what I mean by that is it, it should be heading somewhere, right? If you're going to ask a girl out, and you got no plans to someday marry her, what the hell are you asking her out for? What are you doing with her? Just to hug her? Have someone to hug, hold? You're going to ask a girl out. Make sure it's going somewhere. If you're not sure, then be friends with her. And when you're sure, ask her out. All right, I'm done getting that out of my system. All right, so um, number one indicator that you've transitioned from boyhood to manhood and that you're ready to pursue a relationship, fellas, here's the first step. Uh, you want to write this down. Leave your parents' home. 
leave your parents' home. At the very first marriage in the book of in the book of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, first book in the Bible, after God brought Eve to Adam, God set in place some very clear instructions that every other dude is supposed to follow. You remember that instruction? Genesis chapter 20, 24, God says, for this reason, in other words, for marriage purposes, a man will leave his father and his mama, and he will be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Guys, that instruction is for you. It means that in those years when you start transitioning from boyhood to manhood, in those years when you, start tra uh, when you start thinking more intentionally about dating and marriage, your first step, here it is, fellas, is to move out of mom's place. Move out of dad's place. Get your own place. Now, I know we live in some hard times, and fellas who are single, you're hearing this thinking, man, that is a financial burden at this time. I agree with you. It is. But well, I tell you, man, the truth is that the responsibility of owning your own and maintaining your own place is a great training ground for taking financial responsibility for another man's daughter. You're going to ask another man to give you his daughter in marriage? You need to have your game face on. Right? There's no better ground to learn about marriage than to learn to pay your own bills on time. And to have to come home after work, clean your own apartment, and make your own dinner instead of asking mom or getting upset at mom for not making the right kind of dinner. Fellas, you with me on this? I'm not asking if you agree with me, I'm just saying if you heard me. <laughs> I, I, I honestly love you guys. And you know, I had to learn this the hard way. I, I really did. So if, I, if I'm saying this, it's not me knocking on the guys. My greatest joy, one of my greatest joys, not the greatest, but one of my greatest joy is when Remy's guy say, man, I met a girl and I'm going to ask her to marry me. And especially if, if that guy has been pursuing godliness, man, I, I, I beg that you would let me be the one to marry you because it's a great joy for me. So when I'm hard on you, it's not because I'm trying to be mean on you. It's just I, I, I want to set you up well. All right. Now, as a side benefit, right, you might think it's a financial burden, but, but first of all, it trains you for marriage. You don't think about that. Paying your own bills monthly, trust me trains you for marriage, right? Any married person in here will tell you amen to that. Um, secondly, owning your own place allows the girl you're hoping to someday marry catch a glimpse of the kind of husband she's going to marry. Can, can I say this, fellas? It is a track. A tra it is a tr it's an attractive thing for you to own your own place as a single guy. Because it tells the girl that you're hoping to marry that if he can take care of himself, he can probably take care of me if he can afford his own. And get this, we're not even talking about buying a house or renting a full, heck, have a room, have a shack. But you're paying some kind of monthly, right? it, it, it really gets you in that state of responsibility. By the way, um, that is the number one indicator that you're starting to move from boyhood to manhood, moving out of your parents' home. Historically, that's part of what the process of becoming a man is. It's not growing hair on your chest, moving out of your parents' home. Amen. <laughs> right? That's the first step. Second step. This one's going to be a little hard, and I need to flesh it out. Second step is this. You've got to finish your education or, voca or vocational training. Finish your education or vocational training. Um, let me just say this. I, I don't think everyone needs to go to college. I, I don't think that's for everyone. You know, honestly, some, God has, some of you guys would rather... Would, I mean, there are guys who have made something of their lives who never went to college. So I'm not talking about college or no college. Um, I'm talking about being good at something. I'm sorry, actually, that's not what I'm talking about. That is what I'm talking about. <laughs> you need to be good at something or at least trained professionally at something. That's really what I'm talking about, right? So it doesn't have to be college. I don't give it to vocational training. You got, you got to be good at something. And here's why. You know, there, there was a time when when you graduate from high school or college, you were competing with the people in your class. But we live in a global market today. You are not competing with the guys who live in Netcon. You're competing with kids from China, from Nigeria, from Algeria for the same job. And you know what? All these guys, so, so that's what I'm talking about. You're, you're, in a, you're in a very competitive global market today. Be good at something. Get professional 
training at something. Hopefully, find something or an area of expertise that comes naturally to you and get professional training so you become proficient in that field. That's really what I'm getting at here. I mean, you want to reference the Bible? Uh, Jesus interned under his father Joseph as a carpenter. The apostle Paul was a tent maker. These guys weren't freeloaders. They, they were trained in a particular field. And, and that's all I'm saying, guys. Be trained professionally at something. Excel at something. Leave mommy and daddy's house. Start or finish your education. At least be on track for it. Oh, remember, by the way, I'm not saying you need to have this today. I'm saying you need to be on the path to achieving this. That's all I'm saying. All right, because I realize I might, I'm going to raise the bar very high for you guys tonight, and it's going to seem overwhelming, but I'm really just trying to create a path for you guys to pursue. All right, so leave mommy and daddy's home, finish your education. Number three, start a career, not a dead-end job. Now, let me say this. I actually had this conversation with my wife, and she was like, you probably should clarify that, and so let me clarify that. Um, I... I understand that it's hard today to get a job out there, man. I know about that. I mean, I got people who I'm praying for. So it, market is hard out there. So let me just say this. If you've got a job right now, I don't care if you're working at McDonald's, or at Walmart, or at the White House. You got a job right now, kudos to you. Way to go. You're out there looking. For, if you are out there continually looking for a job, kudos to you. I just want to acknowledge that great job. Okay, keep that up. However, I'm talking about having some sort of long-term plan, Right? I mean, I can't, when I meet young adults, one of the questions after I've gotten to know, especially guys, and even girls too, one of the questions I often ask them, I said, where are you going? Where are you headed in life? What's your long-term plan? And you don't have to have it all cleared up, but at least have some picture of where you're going. And I got to tell you, it's a little disturbing the amount of young adults I've spoken to who I asked that same question and they're like, I don't really know. I don't know. Okay, you are a young adult. You're not a boy anymore. Scripture says when I was a boy, I thought like a boy. But now I'm a man. Here's why that's important for you guys to answer. Because if you know where you're headed in the future, you can identify the tools and the training that'll get you there. Right? If you want to someday be a professional carpenter, you know that, okay, I need this, 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 this now. If you want to be a chef, you know I need this, this, this now. If you want to work with people, okay, you, you, you see what I'm saying? And ladies, by the way, all of this is applicable to you also, but I'm just speaking to the guys tonight. We'll talk to you guys, girls tomorrow, uh, ne uh, next weekend. And, and by the way, these 20-something years are, that's the time. This is when you should be figuring out what you're going to be doing, not playing PlayStation at home all day. Where do you want to go? What are you doing with your life? Secondly, when you start dating a girl or you are starting to ask or thinking about asking a close friend in your life out, here, here's the reality. Um, even though you might not be thinking about that, she's thinking about that. The girl you're asking out is wondering, where is he going? And do I want to be a part of his story? Right? Once again, when you ask a girl to be in your life, that's a, that's a big thing. That's not easy. It's a huge responsibility. You got to have some idea where you're going. You don't have to be there. Just have some idea where you're going and have some sort of game plan in place to get you there. I'm not talking about not liking your job, right? I'm talking about finding something that leverages your skills and your talent, right? So 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line, 20 years down the line, you're just dreaming. Where are you going? Right? Because, because the, way, the best plans are plans where you have a picture of where you're going and you work backwards, right? And you figure out, what do I need? All right. Ten years is where I want to be. Okay, where do I need to be in two years? Or you kind of, or you work your way backwards. Are you with me so far on that? Leave your parents home, guys. Eventually, finish your education or vocational training. Start a career. And number four, I would say, man, this is should have started with this, but it's good to end with it. It's not the last point, but um, love Jesus Christ and serve the church. Love Jesus Christ and serve the church. Use your spiritual gifts within the church. Um, this point is very important, and, and here's why. Let, let, me, let me state this. Guys, God has called you as men in a very unique role. Like, get this. You are created to be cultivators and producers. I mean, think about what God told Adam to do when he made him. <laughs> Adam was created. He's like, dude, you got a job. Like, he, he was made, and he had a full-time job. 
And he could pursue that with passion. And you know what's cool about that? Like God is a, the scripture says, we're all made in the image of God. Man and women were made in the image of God. You'll reflect the creative nature of God. How many of you guys know God is a creator? How many of you guys know God is a creative God? How many of you guys know God's a producing God? All right, so you reflect those attributes of God, which means you are a creator, right? You're not the creator, but you have the ability to create, to produce. So God wants you to be a cultivator. So that means in a dating and marriage relationship, you are an initiator. I'm using all these words, right? You're a cultivator, you're an initiator. Guys, in a marriage relationship, God has called you to be a cultivator, an initiator. So in your dating or in your marriage, God wants you as a cultivator to stir in your spouse or your girlfriend or your female friend. Your your plan in her life is not just to be a passive observer. Part of your role in her life is to continually point her to Christ, right? Um, And that's part of cultivating, right? You're not her pastor. You're not the Holy Spirit. But in that relationship, you should really be taking lead in encouraging godliness in her. At work, God, you you should be seeking God daily, saying, Lord, you own earth. Scripture says gold and silver belongs to God, which, by the way, means every CEO belongs to God. Every company belongs to God. So at work, you should be asking God, what are some creative ideas that have not been thought about yet? Or what are some ideas that could be best leveraged to, to, to make a profit? I didn't think about that. I think sometimes we think, oh, God doesn't. Listen, if you're in a business where it makes money, ask God, how can we make profit here? Like, like what are some business ideas that I've missed, right? Th- that's the idea of initiating, right? You work there. You've seen some strengths in the business. You've seen some weaknesses. Think through. You, you should be leading the charge. At church, men, you should be creating ministries like crazy. Ask for permission later. Start something. God wants you guys and girls, I would even, to to be givers, not just takers. To be producers, not just consumers. God, especially for you guys, God wants you to stop taking the easiest way out. Don't enter into any situation and think, oh, what's an easy thing to do? That's not the heart of a man. Heart of a man Look for a way to run down the path of greatest glory to God, to serve him and to serve others. That's not easy. That's hard. And by the way, fellas, everything I'm saying is hard. But the only way you can begin being a producer and a creator is if you stay closely connected to Jesus Christ, right? Right? Because as you walk with Jesus Christ, Pastor Armin was talking about the Holy Spirit this morning, and I love that. And I, and I was thinking about that and I thought, you know, the idea of walking with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit lives in you. The idea of walking with the Holy Spirit is that you, 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 he dwells within you, but he leads, right? So if the Holy Spirit goes this way, I go that way. And if the Holy Spirit goes that way, I follow him. And the Holy Spirit says, hey, that person over there needs just, they need someone to chat with, to hug with. I go there. If the Holy Spirit says, hey, you know what, here's a wise financial investment. And you have to get some counsel on that to make sure you're not just listening to your own mind. You follow. And the idea is that if you're following the Holy Spirit, guys, God will lead you to whom he's called out for you. I shared this with you guys early on, but my story was like that. For the longest time, this is how I walk with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would go here and I'm like, yeah, I like it here. And the Holy Spirit would come in and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to go there. And, you know, at one point in my dating relationship, I, I, you know, I keep joking about this. I think the Holy Spirit put a block on me. Like, it, it was just, I would date girls, and, and, and I didn't do that wisely, but I would date girls, and, and, and it was clear. The Lord had put on my heart, he wanted me to wait. I can't explain how he did it. It was just, I, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord was calling me not yet. And I remember I was being stubborn about it, and after a service one Sunday here at Remix, this girl who comes to Remix regularly came up to me and said, Shags, please don't think I'm weird. I don't know why, but the Lord told me to put on my heart to tell you, you should wait. I'm like, oh, man! <laughs> you know, like, like, and continually the Lord kept, and so I knew. But I still did what I wanted to do. And finally I got to a point where I'm like, you know what, I think I should really stop fighting with God. I think he knows better. And so I, I, I started as much as I could walking with God. And so one afternoon, one of my professors in school approached me and said, listen, I'm going to Nigeria. I want you to come with me. And I thought to myself, man, I don't really have the money, but I see God has opened his door, so I'm going to follow him. And so I started praying about it. And all of a sudden, within, one, within a month, I raised over $3,500. It takes six months for the average person to do that. 
I raised over $3,500 to pay for my trip within one month. And, and then I followed the Holy Spirit. And, and, and then we got on a plane and the Holy Spirit went to Nigeria and, and, when, and I was following him. And when I landed in Nigeria, now I'm not a big believer in the one. I believe that you meet someone you like and you make it work. I, I think that but apparently God had other plans because when the Holy Spirit got to Nigeria and I got to the lobby of the hotel we were staying at, uh, the Holy Spirit landed on my wife. And I thought the first time I saw her, I thought, that's the girl I'm going to marry. Now, that is not common. OK, I'm not saying don't go doing that. I'm just, that was my story. I still believe that you meet someone you like. That's what I might have with someone, but I believe you meet someone you like. You grow to like each other more. You grow to love each other and you make it work. But the idea is that love Jesus Christ. Follow him. Where is he leading? Are there certain things that are going on in your life where God is saying, that's not good? Well, think about it. God might be saying, I I'm preparing you for something here, but before I take you there, I need to work. So, are you with me? So when you go home tonight and you're praying, just do that. Right? Lord, would you, would you lead me? Seriously, don't do this. Do this. Lord, would you lead me? Because it, it, it'll remind you what we just talked about, right? Okay. So guys, those are the things that need to kind of be present in your life. When those are present in your life, you become incredibly attractive to the male, female friend in your life, right? I mean, let's even go back to the apartment thing. Super Bowl Sunday, right? You want to have a party at your place, invite some friends. How great is it to have a female? By the way, if you have, a, if you have your own place and you host a party at your place, um, the girl you're trying to attract, if you invited her, gets to see how you entertain people. And, and, and if she really likes you, she might help out around the house helping you prepare, and you get a chance to see her. You see where I'm going with this? As opposed to, Mom, we need some more chips! Right? I don't think anyone actually does that. <laughs> I've been watching too many sitcoms, right? <laughs> All right, so once that's done, the next step is to find a female friend. Now, here's what I've observed, guys. We will go to hell and back to win a girl over. But once we've met her, we unintentionally wind things down in the romantic department. I've been guilty of this, all right? We don't do it on purpose, I don't think we do. It's just we work so hard to win her over. We've won her, she's ours, she bears our child, or she lives in our house, we've seen them naked, we're like, hey, you know, we don't need to perform anymore, which is not fair to her. And we'll talk to the ladies next week. Now, I know I said marriage is primarily about friendship, but get this, it's out of friendship that romance blossoms. But here's what you need to know. This is important if you're gonna get married soon. Romance before marriage looks different than romance after marriage. If you don't hear anything else, hear that, right? Because I think before we're married, there are these sparks and heat, and we expect that's going to last till the day we go home to be with the Lord, right? So, so when you're dating, romance can look like an all-expense-paid romantic dinner in the city. You rent a cab, you're in a horse carriage, and you guys are looking at the moon, you're cuddling, and it's nice. It's cold outside, but you're warm inside because they're next to you, and oh, you're just so in love. And that's cool. But after marriage, sometimes the most romantic thing you can do for your wife is to let her sleep in on Saturday, and you clean the house and watch the kids. Sometimes that's the biggest romantic gesture, just letting her rest. Uh, and by the way, that's not, that doesn't mean you can't do these romantic gestures, but I've just found in marriage, romance looks differently after marriage, right? And you got to kind of make things work within your budget. Anyway, that said, I want to talk to you guys because I've talked about what you need to be as a man. Let's talk about how to relate to her, right? So you're developing these characters in your life. The female friends in your life are starting to think, man, I like this guy. He's kind of solid. I've been hanging out with him for the last few years. I think I like him. He's solid. Fellas, let me teach you, or let me talk to you in terms of not how to be more romantic or how to win her over. Let me talk to you in terms of how to honor her, right? Think in terms of honor. How do you honor the woman in your life? There are five of them. And, and this is going to apply to you whether you're married or single. Some of them more so than others. But first thing is this, fellas. Honor her physically. Honor her physically. Guys, you know, there's a passage in the Bible where it says women are the weaker verse vessel. And man, people get up in arms about that passage. Here's really what it's saying, that if a man and a woman were to get in a cage match, he would win. But even more so than that, here's what I'm getting at. Um, God has given you fellows your physical strength and dominance over the women in your life. 
or he has entrusted your physical strength to you so that you can provide protection for her. I mean, you with me on that? Who knows what that means? And you need to learn this now, guys. This is very important. Guys, do not ever raise your hands against a woman, whether she's your sister, a female friend, stranger, ultimately your wife. Um, don't ever physically hit her. Don't ever hit her. Don't ever shove her. Don't ever push her. Don't ever restrain her. Don't raise your voice at her continually. Don't even threaten her with physical violence. The women in your life should not view your physical strength as a threat. They really shouldn't. If they do, you've lost. And make you even less of a man. You know who used their physical strength as a threat to others? Junior high boys. God gave you your physical strength over her as a protection. So here's what that means. It means when a woman looks at you and looks at your physical strength, it should be a safe haven for her. Your physical strength is not intended to intimidate her. It's intended to make her feel safe when she's going out. I'm not talking about getting in a fight, right? Well, let me even say this while I'm at that. If anyone ever disrespects your wife or even a female friend in your presence, um, you should sit down with whoever this dude and make it clear in no uncertain terms that under no circumstance are they to ever talk to her like that. If another man should lift his hand against your girlfriend, your wife, sister, female friend should you have to should use physical force to restrain him I'm not encouraging violence but I'm asking you to be wise <laughs> my wife told me to be careful about how I said that I'm not encouraging violence but should a woman in your life who can who feels intimidated be faced with a situation where she's being threatened physically by another man. I think you have freedom in those situations to use physical violence to restrain, physical force to restrain them. Ideally, you'd be to call in the authorities. But should that not be existing, I think in those situations you should. So physical, honor her physically by protecting her, being a safe haven for her. Honor her physically by not pressuring her to do things sexually to you that should only be done in a marriage relationship. For the most part, the pressures that happen in a dating relationship before marriage is done by the guys. I've been a guy, lived on all male campuses my whole life, went to boarding school. It's generally guys pressuring the girls. A few situations where the girls are, and I'll talk to that next week. But guys, and here's the nonsense that I've heard. If you love me, you'll do this with me. That's rubbish. That's crap. Love has nothing to do with sex. Love has to do with sacrifice. Guys, it's, it's, I understand you're jonesing to get some. You can wait till marriage. I know it's tough. And you know, we're going to have one session where we get to talk to guys about pornography and masturbation and all of that, but, but you really should not be pressuring the woman whom you want to spend the rest of your life with to do things with you that should be safe for the marriage bed. Honor her physically. Honor her emotionally. Honor her emotionally. I've heard that guys don't, I've heard that guys don't like expressing their emotions. That's nonsense. I, well, that's true if you plan to remain single for the rest of your life, right? Because women, um, for them, connect, a woman's physical connection is for her is emotional. They're, God has shaped women to be relational beings, so they connect huge relations. So let me just point you in one direction. The book called The Five Love Languages. How many of you guys have read that book or heard of that book? All right, write it down. The five love languages. A few months ago, Scott did a message here at Remix on all five of them, right? And the five love languages really have to do with how different people 
receive love and express love. So if you're a close female friend whom you'd like to someday marry, experiences love through acts of service. In other words, she feels loved when you help her around the house or you help run errands for her. But on the other hand, you experience love through physical touch, not sex, but just physical touch. You're a hugger. You like, you like back rubs and, and that's your thing. Um, it means that you need to learn to speak her language, right? You don't go to her and say, well, I like back rubs and then you gotta give me one, right? It means you learn to speak her language. You learn to speak her language. And, and get this, as she becomes full emotionally, she serves you out of the overflow of her love. I found that true to be my wife. My wife, for her, it's quality time. And actually, it's changing now. It's become qual- uh, acts of service because we got a little monster at home. Um, <laughs> love him, but he is wrecking the play. Yeah, wait till y'all have kids. You talk back to me. You're like, monster, wait till you have kids. I'll have this conversation again, right? He's all over the place and she just wants to sleep. And I'm like, I'm going to go lock you up in your crib, man, right? Um, um, so, so for her, right, my, my love language is the words of affirmation. So I get back from work and I want to tell her about my day because I want to hear her encourage me. But she's just like, take him, you know, I want to go sleep, right? So, so I could say, well, hold on one second, let me tell you what happened today. Or I could, all right, I'll take him, you go lie down, right? And I'll watch him wake up later on, right? That's, that's the whole, I don't do that, by the way, I just gave, that's the one time I did it. Most of the time, I'm like, I'm like sneaking to the house, like, is she there? Oh, he's awake, he saw me when I walked in. I don't really do that, but okay, so honor her emotionally. Uh, number three, honor her verbally. Honor her verbally. I know most of you guys in here pretty well, and I'm certain that none of you guys would ever raise your hands against a woman. But do you hit her emotionally, uh, verbally, right? Some verbal insults are, leave longer scars or longer lasting scars than physical, physical abuse. Like emotional abuse lasts sometimes longer than physical abuse. So here's the big idea. Um, fellas, let me encourage you at this. Here's how you honor the female friend in your life emotionally. You're trying to win her over. You're trying to really uh, invite her to be a part of your story. Um, here's the big idea. Find ways to call out the beautiful things in her life. Now, I'm not asking you to give her some cheesy pickup lines like you're one of the Jersey Shore guys. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about calling out the redeeming qualities in her life. So uh, you could tell her how impressed you were with the way she walked over to an elderly person and served them. Um, you could tell her how much you appreciate her haircut, her new haircut. Um, I found this with my wife, they like shoes. If you really let them know about their shoes, my wife likes me to notice her shoes, which for some reason I don't notice, but <laughs> tell her how, li- how well you like her new shoes, right? Um, tell her how encouraged you were that she prayed for you, right? So you're not just saying, oh, you look so hot today, right? That's nonsense. Well, actually, no, it's not, but, but um, right? You, be creative with it. Call out the things in her life, the redeeming qualities that you really appreciate. Let me give you an addition. Find the things about her that she doesn't think that you've observed. Of course, you'd have to find out, find that out for, your, for yourself, right? For my wife, it seems it had to do with a new hairdo that she had gotten, and it's very subtle, and I'm like, your hair looks different, right? Or, or perhaps I saw you, woke up at 2 a.m. in the morning and saw you praying in the living room. I just want to say I really appreciate that, right? Now, because you're not married, you're not going to see her praying at 2 a.m. in the morning, right? So let's just, I'm just talking big picture. All right, number four, honor her financially. We're almost done here. Walt, how am I doing? I'm way past my minimum right now, aren't I? Okay. <laughs> honor her financially. This one might be more applicable if you're married. Um, but really, it's the whole idea that regardless of who brings in the bigger income, you both have full knowledge and, and ultimately full input into how the expenses of the home are spent. In a marriage relationship, sometimes one spouse will be better at handling the, sp- the, the finances than others. So you don't go, well, I'm the guy, I'm going to run everything. In our home, I primarily bring in our income, but my wife runs the finances at the house because she's a numbers person. So that means she pays our bills, she, 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 uh, she allots money for groceries, and she gives me my weekly allowance. <laughs> and I got a limit, each week I can go. And that's fine with me because that's how we work in our home. Mm-hmm. And, and let me say this. Since I turned over... The finances to my wife, this is going to sound weird. I have not had a bill collector call me in three years. Thank you. (laughs) Either, either Either you've had bill collectors call you before, right? And here's what I'm getting at with that. Here's what I'm getting at with that. Um, I'm a much better person because of my wife, financially. You know, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. I thought, 
if I knew what I know now financially, if I had the wisdom I had now when I was in college, I'd be stinking rich. But then it dawned on me, uh, actually, no, I wouldn't. Because I didn't begin getting a better handle on my finances until my wife came into the picture. I I'm a much better responsible man today because of her. And part of that was because she brought her gifts into the marriage and I kind of turned that over to her. Listen, finances are really tough in marriage. And, 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 and you will find that there are some occasions where there's a major financial investment you need to make. And you both disagree on whether to make it or not. And in those moments, the husband wants to make a financial investment. The wife says, I don't think it's a good idea. And you're butting heads. You know, in those moments, might I counsel you to do this based on what I've observed in people's marriages that I've observed, based on what I've learned from people who are older than myself, based on what I'm observing in my marriage. Um, number one, especially for you guys, seriously, I mean, I emphasize the word seriously, seriously take into consideration your wife's counsel because she can see blind spots that you can't. But I have found time and time again that the financial decisions that my wife has given or counsel has often been be best. Now, there have been times when I've insisted that I thought this was the wise decision for us. On occasion, I've been right. And I do that very rarely. I, I mean, I make it sound like it's like maybe once or twice. Once I was right, the other time I was completely wrong, and I've let go since then. So when you find yourself at those crossroads, take into consideration her counsel. However, guys, God has entrusted you with the responsibility of leading your home. Which means if you make the wrong decision, you got to live up to it. You got to make sure you're making the right decision. And it's not always that easy. But both couple have input, have full knowledge of what's going on with the finances. It means that you don't, you don't punish your wife finance, you can't spend this. You, you both sit down, decide on what it is you're going to be doing, what is this spendable, what is this not. And last but not least, honor her technologically. Honor her technologically. Man, this is so relevant today than it's been in the last 10, five years. Honor her technolog te technologically. I saw a commercial the other day for a new device. It looked like a PlayStation PSP. I think it's actually called PS Vista or something like that. And it's this stupid device, Vita. It's a stupid device because it essentially lets you keep playing your game even when you leave the house. So th the tagline is, never stop playing. Really? I remember watching a commercial thinking, really, that's what it's become? We can't turn off anymore? We can't unplug? We're in the matrix or what? Like, right? We can't unplug anymore? Here, here's the deal. There's enough technological digital devices out there that'll distract you for a lifetime. And you can get sucked into them. Though it might be fun now as a single, it can result in death in a marriage. It can result in death when you are sitting across from your spouse and she wants some quality time, but you're too busy trying to be the character so you can move to the next level. Because when you get to the end of it, uh, what have you accomplished? <laughs> you shut the game off. Really? Hours and hours going from level to level to level only to shut it off at the end. By the way, as singles, that's a good habit to learn right now to turn off those technological devices, right? If it's not even video game, it could be Facebook. You're constantly checking your text messages, right? In a relationship, that can really be death. You gotta learn to have those moments, right? I, I play video games, but I've kind of learned to let my wife go to sleep. When she's in bed and I'll play, right? And, and I don't sit there for like eight days or eight hours, right? Listen, marriage is one of those things that you really, you're gonna learn on the job but man, you can get a head start on it even as a single. By, by knowing who you should be or the things that should be developing in your life when you get into it. And ladies, kind of have an idea of who you should be and what you should be expecting before you get into it. Guys, I know I dropped a lot on you tonight. Man, I, I realize that. And some of you guys, I'm hoping you don't feel discouraged tonight. I'm hoping you feel encouraged because remember, I didn't say these need to be present now in your life. I said you need to be striving towards it, All right? Get to a point where you're, where you're financially, work intentionally financially to get your own place. Finish your education or vocational training. Get one. Start a career. Love Jesus Christ. When you start interacting with someone you really like, a girl you really like, honor her physically, emotionally, financially, and the rest of the other things I said. Ladies, no guy you meet will ever have these all perfectly. I can guarantee you he will fail you. But you know what? You're going to grow with him, and you're going to learn through it. And, and, and you're both going to become better 
as you work on this relationship. Amen.